that's one thing you, you talked about in the when you were talking about the moving image that intrigued me is you, you mentioned the discovery of the unconscious of dreams, which is by definition a world of fluctuating images, psychedelia, and film, mm -hmm. and by extension we can talk about animation. But it is interesting the way that if you leave aside the different ontological spaces where these things occur, you, you do you are pointing towards some similar logic of flowing images that are pregnant with something more than simply the surfaces of images. Well, you looked at that thing about the film objects, right? Yes. Yeah, I, that was really interesting, I thought, to deconstruct film in that particular way. Well, what, well, like, what is it about that that seems kind of rich? Well, it stresses the role of time in defining all these situations. I mean, a film object is best applied, obviously, to film, but on the other hand, you and I are like that, or an automobile in traffic, or an investment over a decade is still some kind of self-transforming thing, referent to its own structure, but constantly redefining itself. And, uh, that's very... Uh, the world is its own film, or the world is its own kinetic unfolding. And if you take that away, then you don't have a world. If you look at, you know, what we're building with VR, what's just around the corner with these kind of three-dimensional interactive spaces and avatars and imagine a culture that's more and more based on on that kind of interaction. And, you know, obviously there's a kind of shim, uh, superficial shamanic or imaginative dimension to that. But at the same time, it, it's, it's clear that at least initially and in, in certainly in many of its guises, it will be driven by the same kind of chintziness, the same sort of crass, tinkly uh, junk that, that really drives it. How, do you, do you think it's just going to nat naturally evolve such that a kind of deeper uh, shamanic world or at least shamanic analog will emerge in, in virtual reality? Or does it actually require some, some real creative work to seed it? It requires creative work. It requires that the people who build these realities understand how subtle the, what they're up against is and not abandon a commitment to, to realism. You know, the trick to making the shamanic world, virtual world, compelling is to fairly and truly convey it. So you can't cut corners, you can't fake it. So animation and the rules of vermal and all this stuff have to be faithfully executed so that this stuff really does blow people's minds, so that people see, well, the human imagination is large enough to accommodate the human soul. It doesn't leave you feeling like you're wearing too tight a pair of shoes. And that's the, that's the dangers. It just becomes kind of a... Formulaic. Too formulaic. Too easy. Not that the software couldn't use some improvement. But uh, I don't want it to become so easy to produce these virtual realities that there's no uh, attention to detail or no sense of accomplishment in doing it. What would the, the, the kind of ideal Terrence McKenna virtual environment be? Well, all of these, I guess you would call them models or explanations, uh, beginning with basic chemistry right up to hierarchy and management theory, uh, because all these processes can be envisioned, you know, as... Uh, interlocking sets of laws and, and that sort of thing. So the, that's, I guess, what we're talking about, is how the world should become more visual, should ride more on a visual, on a vocabulary of visual assumptions that everybody has learned. And we all know that the Bugs Bunny cartoon is a, a land of explosions and falling anvils. Well, we learned that uh, 
we were taught that. So there needs to be more of this kind of slotting in of, of uh, I don't know what you would call them, assumptions or gestalts that can be used as a vocabulary to communicate this stuff. Like a language, a visual language. Yes, exactly. And, and do you, so do you see that, uh, that some languages from the past, the imagery of alchemy or Egyptian art or or things like that are kind of can be seen as predecessors for a possible new visual language? Well, this is where memory palaces and archetypes and uh, uh, all this stuff come in. That was always the hope. It's not clear it can be realized. I mean, that's why you go through the Maya, the Egyptian, the alchemical, looking for these universal uh, gestalts of meaning, but they're spread wide and far, and it, it may have to be created de novo. Well, that's part of the, the I think, you know, a, a, a more of a skeptic would really, would say, the idea of building a, you know, a universal language is, a, is an old and crusty dream, and, <laughs> and when you get into the realm of, of actually having images involved in it, in a kind of hieroglyphics of virtual space that are linked with meaning that um, it becomes even more challenging to imagine how you can make that kind of thing universal unless it's the universe of you know the Nike swoosh you know it's the universe of logos and advertising which actually is somewhat like this except that its information content is <laughs> and people <laughs> spend a huge amount of money to establish these gestalts exactly yes yeah so I, I don't, I'm not, many of our discussions have led to this point where we seem to say, well, there's something about the thermodynamics of information that we don't understand, something about lexical categories, something about how language wants to emerge from the background of matrix, but something about how we process language holds this back. So then there's a negotiation at some kind of fractal edge, and, that, and that's where we are. But not necessarily. I mean, I, uh, that's why I encourage everybody to think about animation and think about it in practical terms, to look at objects and pose these things to themselves as uh, model, modelable problems. Uh, because out of that will come a language rich enough to support an actual form of human communication that's been very elusive or maybe never in hand at all. Well, it's really interesting when you talk to people or listen to people, how many people who take psychedelics have cartoon-like encounters with beings or and you say, well, gee, this is weird. Cartoons only go back to 1920 or 15 or something. How weird that such an out there technical phenomenon could just grab a whole section of human psychology and uh, camp there with that kind of uh, tenacity. And uh, to me, that indicates it has some kind of archetypal claim on, on that territory and a claim which it can only continue to uh, tighten over time. Have you ever seen that Scott McCloud book, Understanding Comics? N no. Oh, that's worthwhile. That yes, it's really worthwhile. Very good. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just sort of getting at a grammar. You know, a lot of cartoons disagree with a very irascible lot, and a lot of comic people are like, no, it's shit. But it's a very interesting attempt to use the form itself to talk about the specifics of the form. I mean, it's really about comic art, but it applies to some of these issues of, of animation and, and uh, cartooning. Well, the great genius of Disney, I mean, Disney is a, my idea beyond Edison or Ford or anybody of what we really mean by an American genius because he, you know, he had mice who wear gloves living inside his head but he was able to create a mechanical technology to show people these mice. 
So instead of just being put quietly away by his brother or something like that, he said, no, no, you don't understand. Money. This is worth money. If we can show people these glove-wearing mice and talking ducks and, and all this stuff. And then he was sufficiently a true American Yankee genius that he saw how to to take a flip book and put it on celluloid and, uh, and do all that. Yeah, I think Disney is a very, very far out person. I mean, he went to the platonic ideas and came back with, you know, baskets full of them and released them uh, in American towns and cities and uh, did very well. I mean, animation is a great place to see the reflection of things that are happening, you know, in the culture at large. And certain people take it to incredible heights. Uh, have you seen, uh, do you know that animation called Asparagus? You should check it out. It's about 20, maybe it's 15 or 20 years old, but it's this, you know, it's as real, it's very highly detailed as realistic as a Van Eyck painting, and totally surreal. And uh, there's also, uh, do you know that one by Sally Cruikshank called uh, Quasi at the Quackadero? That's a DMT extravagance, uh, a carnival, basically a cartoon about a carnival, but it's a carnival crazy enough to convince you you should go take drugs, basically. Um, and Max Fleischer was a genius and all these people. You know. Fleischer, was, Fleischer was great. I mean, I think, I think that, I think Fleischer is the true origin of, of underground comics. I think that you find the most pregnant um, uh, images of a certain kind of seedy, like, like the way that Rar Crumb presents a certain kind of seediness and, f and f sort of failure of the bodies and spaces. And yet that's infused with a kind of like, you know, magical eye. So you really have that both in flesh and you really have the, the mania of the Betty Boop, but also a certain real kind of quotidian, almost proletarian uh, um, graininess to these characters. Yes, yeah, uh, it would be very hard to imagine post-modernity without Crumb's input. And I consider him an absolute psychedelic genius. Very few people have had the influence without the karma that Crumb had. He basically did all that stuff, sold the drawings and moved to a chateau in southern France and called it quits and uh, got away with them, those moves. I mean that's one of the one of the thing, things again that I just find totally fascinating is like the magic of modernity. You mean what a strange strange thing this is. Yeah and just the relationship of modernity to esoteric religious undercurrents and things which are not accounted for in, in uh, enlightenment discourse. Yeah, what if it just gets more and more like this? In other words, what I think that's what's actually happening. Is yeah. we're, we're really headed for our own private Idaho, uh, more faster, deeper, and with more uh, panache than anybody ever dared suppose. I, I mean, in terms of build, building our, our own sort of constructed world right. perspectives and communicating them to some degree, but not in a way that dominates ideologically or well and we have no idea how strange the worlds we can create in the near term will be and yet they will be it's coming at you right but just how far back to go on like what's witnessing this bizarre moment in in history you know what point are you is the perspective kind of sitting in that's the part i find really hard to figure out does that, does that make well, sense? that's the question. I mean, because what that boils down to is how real is it? How real is it? Mm. Yeah, it's complicated. Every age seems to design its own uh, image of its own dissolution.
and they happen over and over again. I mean, when I think about the 20th century, you know, I mean, Europe, which is the source of world civilization, stomped flat twice, uh, millions of refugees, the, you know, Auschwitz, the whole thing. Meanwhile, you know, what went on in the Far East of Asia and the Asian prosperity wars and all this. It's uh, over and over again, these cultures create their Ragnarok acted out way over the top. I mean, Germany for crying out loud. Yeah, what, so what, how would you describe that character? What's the character of our dissolution? I don't know. I guess it was Nietzsche who pushed the myth of the eternal return, right? So it's some kind of, uh, it's like a closed cycle of Hegelian dynamic where it just works itself out then the thesis the antithesis the synthesis and the darkness and then it starts over again. that uh nichols book that i told you about living time what was most impressive about that book was he lays out this idea of like time and he basically kind of presents a way of thinking about eternal return which is that we're locked into these repetitive cycles that are eternally reiterating themselves. The only way of changing their quality is to increase consciousness in the midst of them. And so you affirm your, this life, this world, not some transcendent world and just the and then try to solve it. Like under the sign of this is always this way. And how does that mean to relate to the real as it presents itself as if there's no other thing that can be than that? And that, but as you do this process, you change your relationship to the stream and then all this other heavy, heady stuff happens. But it was very interesting. It was like, because other, up to that point, I'd always thought of the eternal return on a kind of philosophical level. And I never thought, what does it mean to actually live in the world of the eternal return? Now that's pretty heavy. That's interesting. Yeah, well, I've always felt like that reality was a kind of uh, thing that the way you made progress was you grasped it in the sense that you grasp a mathematical or geometric proposition or something like that. That it's something which, once understood on some level, clears the way to advance a very short distance. So that's what you're always trying to do, is create this lexical space of presumed understanding and, uh, and live inside that. What are some of your wilder ideas about kind of technological situations? Should be happening? Media technology or, or, or lying ahead? Well, the vision I always saw as inevitable, and I still do, and I'm very attracted to it, and shall be sorry to miss it if I do. And that is, I can imagine the 20th century defined, I mean, the, the next century defined by a very huge spacecraft that are, uh, that cycle from the inner to the outer solar system. That seems to me the way to do it, to create these worlds which have like, say, 80-year orbits that carry them clear out to Uranus and all these places and to the inner solar system and that these things are just self-constructed hives of human activity and they invent their own raison d'etre at each point in these voyages and there's travel between them but largely they are city-sized or larger constructs. And that, that must be how it will work, powdering down asteroids. And I would, you know, I would really like to see a breakout in the next century. How long can we wait for starflight? 
I mean, how long before the contradictions in terrestrial existence just become too tearing and you either have to go to some kind of fascism and really turn the screws or uh, things fly to pieces. You know? Yeah, that's... but but I really always felt as a science fiction fan and all that 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 starflight, that galactic citizenship, was what you're aiming for. And even if you're the only fucking citizen, that's fine. But if you have to go up to the great council of the Talixilu or whatever that shit was in Dune. But yeah, this flinging ourselves around the solar system in enormous, that's obviously all doable. In other words, it doesn't require any rearrangement of the laws of physics. It just it requires that we don't all murder each other and we continue to pursue commerce. So this is reasonable at some level to expect. And uh, there needs to be... I wish there were a face on Mars or something like that that would drag the popular imagination. You know? But I see the I see strong movements in some levels for an imagination of Mars as a place to inhabit. It seems like Mars is is happening. I mean, it, it's in the scientific imagination. It's in the high science fiction imagination. And why not? I mean. Yeah, it's a pretty cool idea. I mean, it's insane. And it's like, I wouldn't go first. <laughs> <laughs> or a 10,000th problem. Yeah. Well, between that and what's out at the edge of the solar system, it seems to get quite exotic. And as what life is understood to be expands, it's all converging. I mean, there are there is mind under the ice of Europa. Not I don't know mind. That's the, but there's a lot of complicated and hard to define and edgy shit uh, from on on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. What do you mean, like edgy shit? Well, like um, hot water trapped in methane environments under deep ice. You know, there's this late hot water in there for something and complicated chemistry. And you know, they're drilling into this lake in Antarctica that's under 4,000 meters of ice and has been there 20 million years and utterly undisturbed in total darkness for I mean, this insane geological and they're culturing stuff out of it out of the mud that's been under there. It's alive, it's still alive. So... Whoa, that's, uh, that's good through the Lloyd. Yeah, isn't that... Bizarre. Bizarre. Yes, yes, exactly. So, um, if I, you know, it would be a great time to be a xenobiologist. Or, and it, it could be Europa, it could be Titan, it could be Mars. Well, that would just be a... What a fascinating encounter. Yeah, that's a great a great rap. But that almost seems more likely that we encounter some kind of weird life form underneath. But it's not, you know Hi, we are from Orion. And we're not interested in you. We have no questions. We have no answers. <laughs> <laughs> this idea has been gaining strength for twenty years that life is not unique to Earth. It must have drifted in on a chunk of stuff. And it's it's an alchemical rule. It's the rule of homogeneity. You know, as above, so below. Given the circumstances as we find them, what rational momentum is there to think that life is unique and arose on this planet only? So. It's much easier for me to imagine that on a certain level, but at least the galaxy or our local part of the galaxy has some kind of other minds. In it. I mean, I'm, it may be it may be not true, but it's almost the same way of the way that we model, you know, hopefully model a, a future. It's almost like you kind of imagine it, so that all the, you know Star Trek even is kind of this weird dress rehearsal for a certain phase of of this kind of uh, realization. That's just a story. 
This is science fiction story. Well, but you could have said it of Jules Verne in 1885 and been right. You know. Yeah, it is a rehearsal. And, you know, psychedelics kind of seem like, to me, imaginative rehearsals of some <laughs> other event. And whether that event is merely my own individual death or some kind of cosmic event, event I, I completely suspend judgment on. And I don't know if I will be able to... I don't think I'll move from my present position, position of like, well, who knows? Who knows? Uh, yes, it's the big who knows. So what do you think's the, the up with the... Uh, extraterrestrial imagery that features so heavily in some strands of psychedelic experience. You mean the cat-eyed, that kind of imagery? The cat-eyed alien gray, pudgy little... That and just the sense of, uh, I think it seems like a lot of people just even describe the sense of an extraterrestrial intelligence or well, remember we were talking last night about how everything wants to articulate itself. Everything wants somehow to communicate and be perceived as language. When that impulse is most clearly separated from its object, or from its source, I guess you'd say, then maybe that's what you get, is this Gumby-like pure impulse toward communication or something like that. I mean, it seems to me it's like um, looking at a pure function, a pure psychological function of some sort. You see what I mean? No longer rooted in... In, in its source. Source being biology and the evolution of physical form on this particular planet. Yeah. And so that once it reaches a certain kind of... It can uh, actually walk away from itself. And then there you have it. And you're saying, you know, how, what is this? It's category confounding. It can't be. It's uh, an essence without an object mm. or something like that. And, uh, yeah, I've had, I've had some pretty profound moments of... of feeling like contact with something like extraterrestrial intelligence without believing it even often in the interior of the trip that it was. Oh, you mean while loaded? Yeah, even at the time going, okay, this is I'll this let phenomenon. this happen. Yeah, this is, the, this is a phenomenon occurring. Um, rather than, oh, I'm finally seeing it. And, uh, or maybe you just sort of geared for it with science fiction. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how real was it? Well, I mean, it's. I mean, maybe it's just the language that I use for other. That if you, you know, if you present me with some kind of intelligence or communicating force that seems to be other, that's very high, you know, very evolved, that maybe I'm just going to tend to see it more as as alien. But even in terms of those buzzes, like the kind of weird way that sounds can like form these vibrating matrices, is they've often like they often take on a kind of more metallic quality and become more synth synthetic. And with that rising, begin to enter into an, an imagery realm that's very Peculiarly cosmic. alien. It is peculiarly alien and technological often, as opposed to natural. Uh -huh. That's the place. And, uh, and that's, you know, this, that's like a lens or something. Of, I mean, because if you imagine if you're on, if, you know, histories if you if you imagine it pouring forward or moving ra rapidly forward there's a kind of front edge that's very weird because it's sort of like birthing all whole sets of new foam yeah like yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah oh, i know that place hmm. what is the nature of the entities what constitutes their apparent agency or communicative agency? Well, I think that's the question that remains unanswered. You know, that's the grail of the thing. What is the nature of the other is basically what you're asking. Is it a construct, a projection, or a discovery? 
it's not clear to me what it is. Do you feel like you've gotten any closer to that? It's probably a discovery, which is the most radical conclusion. I mean, I think that's probably what you think, too, based on the, your description of your DMT trip and all that, that ultimately it is irreducible. You know, it is too weird to tell. I don't know whether it was a C.M. Cornbluth story, but it was all about these aliens come by and contact the United Nations and all this. And But somehow this book, To Serve Man, uh, uh, comes to the surface, and then it's slowly realized that it's a cookbook. <laughs> and this really spoils the party. <laughs> <laughs> what about the communications that come in from either the extraterrestrial, quote-unquote, or seeming, or the technological world? Well, obviously, it requires discrimination to, to figure out. You can't believe everything you hear. The demons are of many kinds. Some are made of ions, some of mind. The ones of DMT you'll find stutter often and are blind. <laughs> Just because something can talk doesn't mean it isn't selling you something you may not want to hear. Right. Now, that time in that, in that phrase, you said the ones on DMT can be but I've, I've also heard you say ketamine there. The ones on ketamine. Have I said that about yeah. ketamine? Yeah. Well, we need to control me a little more <laughs> tightly. <laughs> what is your What is your uh, opinion on ketamine? I right. think it's an intrauterine memory drug. I think there are things about it that cause you to recapture some kind of intrauterine state. It's echoic. It's weightless. It cancels the sense of gravity, so you don't feel your lungs rising and falling. It's, uh, I sort of agree with you. I see its fascination. I would not want to become embroiled in its tentacles, because yeah. it seems to me a little too easy, a little too fascinating. Do you think uh, ketamine is hollower, partly because it's just a synthetic, that it doesn't hasn't emerged in the ancient matrix of the biosphere? No, I think one of the big, uh, one of the interesting unanswered questions is why do these chemicals have the characters that they do? You know, why do they have these personalities? Why is there Maya and imagery inside mushrooms and mescaline and this and that. And so ketamine's character is simply somehow conferred from whatever strange dimension this is that sends these drugs their personalities. And it certainly is an interesting personality. And Lily is, you know, John is a juggernaut. Do you know him? No. Oh, my God. John's such a trip. I mean, some people are just... He seems, but he's like, I mean, he's really kind of out. Oh, definitely. Like, you meet him and you're like, this guy's out. Yeah, this guy is, there's nobody home. This guy cannot be left alone at home. I mean, he's like me. <laughs> what a trip. And such... You know, an amazing arrogance, an amazing conviction of your own uh, that you've got it all figured out. You know? Yeah, a relentless character. He told me once <clears throat> when we were at Esalen, I don't know what we were doing, just the two of us standing somewhere, and he said, Nature loves you ruthlessly. And I thought, mm, well, that's an interesting observation. Just ruthlessly, actually. <laughs> was he speaking specifically about you? Yeah, he and I were the only two uh. people present. It was just a private conversation. He used to have this Obi-Wan Kenobi robe that he 
war around Esalen. It was just hilarious. And he would just show up out of the fog, you know, uh, to lay these wraps on you. Yeah, they didn't make too many of John. Ketamine actually distills a certain element of, of the psyche and then just it lets that element interact with this whole weird plane. And there's not a lot of connections with the animal body. But the tryptamines are like carrying the animal body all the way through it all. So it's all still yeah. archaic and there's sex and there's fear and all of these, an the animals in this space. The yeah. ketamine is like a little drop of like awareness, pure awareness, <laughs> enters into this zone. It and is you just completely, a bit like that. You're completely, I mean, you know, if you remember like things in your life, they're all part of these networks of cosmic cause and they're so impersonal. I mean, it's a very impersonal environment. Sometimes on ketamine, I had the impression it's like this all the time. I simply don't notice, which isn't a very sense-making perception. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. No, it does have an always-already quality to it. The cold quality of time already. is very different than with uh, also with strictly, which have a more kind of propulsive. Yeah, you're right about how it accentuates the animal body and just shows you some kind of hyper state of uh, I don't know being or even the tablet yeah something like that where it's just a 50,000 percent more powerful than you thought was the specs would tolerate <laughs> what do you think of MDM it, it's it never Fun me like it apparently did other people. It seemed very pleasant. I, I didn't quite ever get, you know, the fight to save MDMA and all that. Uh, I figured from what I was hearing around me that it was doing a lot of good in psychotherapy, and so those people should be supported. But personally, I never. F uh, it seemed. Well, it seemed like very much like every drug as it's introduced into society. It's usually claimed to solve relationship problems and to then, well, that's the best packaging, is to say that a drug solves relationship problems. Well, of course, the link to that right on the, right on the top was, you know, the, the warning that you could believe that you were deeply involved with somebody and wind up making stupid decisions. Oh, well, when was that not true? Yeah. <laughs> no, I remember the first time, I mean, that was specifically one of the stories that was told her, and that was relatively early. That being, You mean people deciding to marry the wrong person? Or whatever, yeah, that kind of thing. Because they... They had such an intimate experience. I only had a few. I only took it a few times. I find it extremely taxing in the system. In a way that I, that I, I oh, you mean the next day you yes. feel terrible? Yeah, I find it very taxing in a way that makes me very dubious about it. It's an amphetamine. It's yeah. hard to take the A out of amphetamine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. The amphetamine down. It's really quite a monster. I actually like a, a crystal methadrine, but it's not worth it. It w just wears you it's too just, hard. Yeah, it's too hard. It's like so. I'm. It's fun, but. Every kind of gear stupid. is flopping on its axle by the time you're through. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a position about the relationship of the psychedelic experience to non-psychedelic mysticism? Oh, I think I see what you're trying to get at. Some kind of, what's the neoplatonic, what's the platonic connection to the psychedelic experience? That's one way of thinking about it. Yeah, in that sense, yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe we need to ask the question over again. But uh, the the psychedelic vision is of some kind of relevant thing. It isn't just uh, 
it's the equivalent of a dust bunny under your psychic bed or something like that. It's actually a product of the, well, I mean, it's hard to English it, but the product of the fractal laws that govern information theory. That That's a theme, I mean, that uh, Neil Stevenson and all these people understand, that it really is all about how everything is put together at the informational level. There's no deeper truth. And so all this talk about code and uh, virtual reality and how the portions of our reality might be code running in some way and all of this. This is all, I think, trying to get at, at uh, something about information theory that is needs to be fundamentally understood before we can all together take the next step to the next level.